podcast. Hello, welcome to Internews Earth Journalism Network webinar series. My name is Amy Sim from the Earth Journalism Network Asia Pacific Project. Thank you all for joining us today. The topic of today's webinar is investigative wildlife trafficking and conservation reporting. How to be a top wildlife journalist. We're very pleased to co-host um, today's webinar with the Ox Packers, Wild Eye, and the Wildlife Conservation Society India. Before I turn it over to our speakers, I'd like to say a few words about the Earth Journalism Network, since not all of you would be familiar with us. The Earth Journalism Network, or EJN for short, is a project of Internews, which is an international NGO working to ensure access to trusted and timely information. EJN is a community of around 12,000 journalists from 180 countries who share the same passion for environmental reporting. At EJN, we work closely with the journalists improve the quantity and quality of environmental reporting. You can find out more about us on our website, earthjournalism.net. And if you like to sign up as a member, it's free. We put up lots of different opportunities for journalists and other content providers. This webinar today is one of a series of webinars that EJN is holding on COVID-19, its environmental origins and its impact. If there are specific topics you would like us to cover in our future webinars, please write in uh, in the chat function here or email us at info.ejn at internews.org. As you know, the emergence of COVID-19 and other zoonotic diseases are closely linked to wildlife trade. Today, our speakers will share tips on how to conduct a media investigation into wildlife trafficking. The webinar will last for around an hour. You can send in your questions throughout the webinar. We can ask, we ask that you use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to send in your questions. Please put down your name, the country you're from, along with your questions. We will collect your questions and address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. I will now turn over to our first speaker, Aristo Mendes, to tell us how Wildlife Conservation Society India is working with the media to combat wildlife trafficking. Over to you, Aristo. Thank you, Amy. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Aristo Mendes. I'm just going to give a short brief about how the webinar came into place and how our interaction with Oxpeckers and EGN came into place. Uh, I work as the analyst lead with the Counter Wildlife Trafficking Program. Uh, our program in India is about two years old, and we have a global presence for similar work for more than 10 years with WCS. Uh, we work mainly as a facilitator for enforcement agencies so that they can counter wildlife trafficking. Uh, one of the ways through which we do this is having training programs and uh, we provide trainings in the form of legal assistance, tech assistance and any other form of uh, help that enforcement needs to counter wildlife trafficking. Uh, while we have these training sessions, uh, one of our main sources to get context for wildlife trafficking is media. Uh, the benefits of uh, having wildlife trafficking incidents reported in media is that it's real time, it has diverse nar narratives, it has multiple species, and the best benefit is it, it creates a public record. Uh, what we do is we end up stitching all these stories and giving context to enforcement, telling them uh, what are the species that are affected in those regions, who are the people that are involved, and uh, what are the threats that those species uh, face. Uh, through this dialogue, we realized that it is important for setups like ours to uh, engage with uh, journalist, uh, investigative journalism uh, institutions. And uh, we got in touch with the Oxpeckers, and um, they've been very kind enough to come up with this journal, uh, with this webinar, where we are trying to have initiatives similar to this uh, go on to promote regional journalists who will be able to bring out facts about evolving methods of how wildlife crimes operate, bring out the fact about who is it that is involved uh, and in facilitating wildlife trafficking, the syndicates, the people, and finally also to turn investigative stories into enforcement action. So we, we, this is just the first interaction, but I hope that similar such initiatives will take place in the near future and we are able to get there. With that, uh, I will have, uh, I'd like to have Roxanne Joseph uh, speak about the ox pickers and the wildlife initiative. Thank you, Aristo. OK, 
Okay, good afternoon everyone and thank you for joining us today. I'm Roxanne and I work with Oxpeckers on the WildEye tools. Today I'm going to be speaking a little bit about what WildEye can do for you and how you can use it in your work as well as using data to produce compelling wildlife and conservation stories. If you would like to Sorry, if you would like to have a look at the tool while I'm speaking, uh, the link is now up on the screen and I think it should be in the chat as well. It is oxpeckers.org forward slash wild eye map dash Asia. We have two tools like this, one based in Asia and one based in Europe. And I really encourage you to have a look at both of these tools during, but especially after this presentation to see whether or not it's something you could use and if there are any stories that you would like to pitch. So what is WildEye? WildEye is a data-driven tool that maps seizures, arrests, court cases and convictions of illegal wildlife trafficking all across the continent. It was developed by journalists for journalists at Oxpeckers in partnership with Earth Journalism. And what we've done is we've created our own data set. We collect information from a series of sources um, in a multitude of different ways. And we've made this accessible in a completely free and easy to use platform. WildEye allows for personalized access to data. So you can um, position the tool so that you're looking at information that is relevant to your interests specifically. And you can use this to conduct your own analysis, research, and produce stories of your own, among other things. What does WildEye actually do? So as I've already said, WildEye is a map, and it's populated with icons containing specific details about a seizure, an arrest, a court case, or a conviction. And if you go into the tool, you'll see that the different icons in different colors represent each of these categories. So you can filter your experience one of two ways. The first is either by selecting a category in the top right hand corner of the tool. Um, you can also set it to say all categories for a general overview of the area that you're interested in. Um, the other way you can filter your use of WildEye is by searching for a specific keyword in the top left hand corner of the tool. And this can be virtually anything, pangolin, scale, rhino, a specific country, a specific region, um, a specific suspect's name. Um, yeah, we also have an alert system that allows the user to stay up to date. So there's no need for you to manually search for updates. You can rely on WildEye to do this for you. And you can subscribe to the system also in the left hand corner of the tool um, via email. You don't have to sign up for anything and you'll receive updates via email, but you can opt out at any time. How can journalists use WildEye? So I've already said that this is a tool designed by journalists for journalists, but it's obviously not exclusively for journalists. And I'm sure that there are people on here who would use this data for different reasons. So this does apply to anyone using the tool. You can use WildEye to track specific data, patterns or trends such as where law enforcement efforts concentrated, and you'll be able to see this based on where points are situated on the map. Do smugglers have a preference for certain routes, or is there more intense control because there are a lot of data points in a specific area on the part of law enforcement? And the big question that we're constantly trying to answer is why do so few seizures result in convictions? You can also use WildEye to identify cases to build new stories, which our two investigative journalists have done and we'll speak about a little bit later. And now more than ever, you can use WildEye to use your voice to tell important stories and hopefully affect change. WildEye in South Asia. So we currently have well over 100 incidents mapped in this region only. There are several hundred across the continent. Um, in South Asia specifically, they're mainly based in India, but we also have incidents in Bangladesh, Bhutan, and Sri Lanka. And we got this information by working with local journalists to identify possible data sources. 
Some of the popular commodities that have showed up quite a bit in this specific data set are big cat skins, pangolin scales, reptiles such as geckos and turtles, elephant tusks, rhino horns, um, and things made of ivory. The main um, route that illegal trade takes place within South Asia, at least according to WildEye, is interregional. But we do have lots of incidents that go to and from Eastern Europe and a significant amount that go to and from Southeast Asia. And the most popular transport methods are air travel followed by shipping containers, as well as people crossing the borders through various modes of transport. Okay, so I'm going to be speaking a little bit about using data-driven techniques for storytelling within the context of WildEye. And I'm going to touch on four things. Data sources, story angles, publishing or presenting your story, and considering the impact that your story might have. So when it comes to sourcing this type of data, the first place that you should look, wherever in the world you're based, is to see if a centralized database exists. This is where you'll get a big data set, hopefully, um, and an overview of what the situation is like in your area of interest. Now, this doesn't exist for every single country in the world or even every single region, um, but where it does exist, it's proven incredibly useful. There are things that you need to consider when accessing this type of database, such as um, can you get the raw data, um, is this data verified? Where does it come from? Um, what language is it available in? And will you need funding to access this type of data? Courts and law enforcement are also a wealth of information for wildlife trafficking um, incidents, especially when it comes to seizures, arrests, and the follow-ups to those types of incidents. Often this will require um, kind of putting your foot through the door, making friends with people um, in both of these uh, industries or sectors rather and being very polite when you ask for this information but often this is where you'll find data or information about cases that may not have yet been released to the public other sources include organizations monitoring this type of information as well as ngos when you approach them ask if they're willing to share their information and if there's possible room for collaboration. And lastly, of course, WildEye and our partners. Um, as I've said, it's a very substantial data set and we're always looking to build on it. Story angles. Before I speak about specific angles, um, which you are free to use so long as you let us know and work with us on them, um, it's very important that you find a gap in reporting and seize it. So there are lots of stories that are being told over and over and over again. For example, in light of the global pandemic, um, pangolin trade, illegal pangolin trade. Now, this doesn't mean that the story itself is um, overreported and that there aren't other stories around the issue to be told. But it's always important to see what isn't being spoken about. And a great way of doing this is using the data to tell your story. Now, I'll touch on this again and again and again, but one data set, no matter how big or small, will always be able to tell more than one story. So look closely at it and let it guide you. Now, when it comes to specific story angles, these are just a couple of ideas. Um, are the incidents mapped in South Asia criminal networks or are individuals or smaller groups committing these crimes? How many of these incidents are related to traditional medicine in Southeast Asia? What are authorities doing to crack down? How harsh or lenient are these sentences? I already said that's a big question um, that we're continuously trying to answer. Are these repeat offenders or once-off criminals making to, look a buck, making to look a quick buck? And is India a trade hub or are commodities just passing through? As I've said, you're free to use these so long as you do let us know um, they aren't exclusive or anything. They're just ideas that come to mind when looking at this data set. Means of presenting the story. So a data-driven investigation is no different to any other type of investigation when it comes to this list of things. So first and foremost, consider your audience. 
who is going to be reading, watching, or listening, or consuming your story. That'll already help you to lay out the presentation of your story and decide how best to produce it. What platforms are you pitching to? Um, are you going to put together data visualizations? And if so, are they going to be static or interactive? And this ties into the platforms um, that you're going to be publishing on. So you need to make sure you know what these platforms can and can't handle. Of course, you have to consider if it's print or if it's online. Um, and again, you may want to use different types of visualizations depending on your audience. Always include photos if possible. You may have to improvise, which is okay. Um, but if you can get original photos, especially for these types of stories, it makes them a lot easier um, to relate to. So a story with um, a lot of imagery, strong visualizations and data will be a very compelling investigation. Very important is always linked to a data set and sources uh, where possible. Of course, sometimes this, you can't always do this, um, but wherever possible, this will provide context and uh, verification for your story. So it's really important, especially if you're using other people and organizations data. Um, video and audio can also be powerful, but not necessary. And as I've said, let the data guide you. Lastly, how to ensure that your story has impact. This is a tough one. And I think you need to think of it in the long term more than anything else. But it's important to stick with it and keep working and keep trying to, to affect change. So first and foremost, outline your goals up front and continuously refer back to these over and over and over again. This will look at things like your audience, like the publications you're pitching to. Um, are you meeting these goals? If so, um, you know, uh, is the publication that you're working with happy? If, they're if your goals have changed, why is this? Maybe it's because the story has developed in a different way, or perhaps you've gone completely off track and you need to kind of center that. Collaborate with NGOs and other journalists. There's no need to work on this alone. Um, you will get the glory at the end of the day, but you're more likely to get more information, better information, and have a story that's more wide reaching if you work with other people. Um, I've already said one data set produces multiple stories. This also means that you can follow up stories over and over again, um, and publish in different languages and on different platforms and use social media to put your story out there as much as possible because the more people who read it, the more people you'll be educating and in the long term, the bigger impact you'll have. That's it from me. Um, thank you so much. I'm gonna hand over to my colleague in India, Sadiq. Over to you, Sadiq. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, excellent. Hi, hello. I am Sadiq Nakvi. I am an independent journalist based in uh, Assam, which is in Northeast India. It, it, is, it is, the state is said to be the gateway to the Northeast India, which is basically seven small states bordering Bangladesh, and Myanmar, and also China. I, am, I will be telling you, I mean, I'll be sharing my recent experience of reporting on uh, rhino poaching, which, is, which, which was uh, very, very prevalent uh, till 2016, after which the numbers uh, started coming down. Nevertheless, it continues. This year, we have seen two cases of rhino poaching already. Uh, in Kaziranga National Park, which is which is the which is said to be the largest, uh, uh, pop which has the largest population of the Indian rhinos. So I will be sharing my presentation with you. So uh, a little about the story. Assam, uh, 
Assam is a state of about 3.3 million people. It is. It it has. Uh, it borders Bhutan. It borders. Uh, it borders Bangladesh. It borders. Uh, it doesn't border Myanmar, but Myanmar Myanmar border is close. I mean, it it falls on the smuggling route, basically. So between 2011 and 2020, around 160 rhinos have been poached in Assam. This is this is including the two rhinos uh, which were poached earlier earlier this year. One one in May, the case which I have discussed in detail in my story, which I'll be coming which I'll come to later, and another one in August recently. The problem is that, you know, I mean, the law enforcement in Assam has focused, the focus of the law enforcement in Assam has been on securing the national parks, the rhino habitats, basically. So you have, uh, you have about uh, uh, the, the national parks, which have a rhino population include Kaziranga, which is in central Assam. Then you have Manas National Park. Uh, this was, this was, this is a, this is a national park, which is uh, right on the border with Bhutan. It is, it is a space which has been, uh, which has seen incidency in the past and uh, till about, till say 2014 when an army operation started. So, so uh, th there was a lot of impact on wildlife. So what law enforcement here have done is they have, they have, they, their focus has been on securing these, uh, these, these, these national parks. So you see, for example, Kaziranga has a very big, uh, uh, what you call, uh, force you have you have forest guards you have a special rhino protection force uh, you have other you have other enforcement mechanisms you have uh, you have uh, you have uh, a network of uh, uh, cctv cameras so it's it's basically a mix of technology and uh, uh, you know man uh, you know special forces which are manning so what is hap what is happening in kaziranga is that you know you they have been able to arrest a lot of people and in some cases they have been able to, uh, you know, there have been a lot of encounter killings as well, which, which even became controversial. But there is there is little attempt to go beyond uh, arresting the local conduits, so to say. So you will see you will see a lot of people uh, being picked up from the areas around the national park. So these people may maybe maybe the last they they form basic. I mean, if they are their involvement. Uh, even if they are involved, they are at the last, uh, you know, they are at the last of the chain. So there, there is no attempt to go beyond or rather very little attempt to go beyond uh, the other parts of this chain. So what happens, for example, after a rhino is poached, what happens, what happens to the horn? Like who are, what hap who are the, uh, who are the other people in the chain? What happens after it's, for example, it's transported uh, from Assam onwards to Arunachal Pradesh, via Nagaland to Myanmar and further to Vietnam and China, or through the other route from Assam to directly to Nagaland and to Manipur. So these were, these were some loopholes, which, uh, which the enforcement was not really focusing on till recently. This was also because, uh, because of the, uh, I mean, because of uh, the gaps in coordination. So there is, there, there, there were problems in coordination between the agencies of different states. So, for example, if the crime is taking place in Assam and the criminal belongs to Nagaland, so you need police from both the states to be cooperating. And because there is lack of interest in enforcement agency, general lack of interest about wildlife crime, this is also a region, by the way, which, is, which has uh, a presence of all, uh, a lot of insurgent outfits. So wildlife crime is really not... Uh, on, on, you know, high up on the agenda of the enforcement. They, they, are, they are mostly busy with other things and their hands are full. So because of that, because of that, uh, these criminals, uh, you know, take advantage of the situation and investigations mostly, they, they, uh, they are confined to, uh, you know, these local conduits. And uh, rarely one would see any attempt to kind of uncover the larger network. There are a lot of problems uh, in reporting. Uh, I mean, as a wildlife, I mean, as, as someone who started uh, getting into this uh, story. So there have been, there have been issues in reporting. Now to start with, uh, there has been, there has been uh, 
a lack of records in public domain you there is no so there is there is you would not find a lot of data available on government websites you will you will for example assam forest department website doesn't have too much data it is not even updated properly but even the central uh, uh, websites even the central departments in new delhi which deal with the whole country the ministry of environment and forest and uh, even uh, the wildlife crime control bureau which is which is this specialized agency supposed to coordinate and also maintain a, i mean it's supposed to coordinate between different state agencies for a proper investigation and also maintain a database its website is also not properly updated there is no database uh, so to say to track cases over where one could go and you know check for specific like for example wildlife wild eye is uh, like for example gives you a lot of information there is there is no government database uh, like that which where you can go and check for specific uh, cases or even a cumulative uh, data of what has happened for example in the last 6 months or the number of seizures in last 6 months or the number of poaching cases in the last 6 months lastly the, the terrain in northeast india it's a difficult terrain there is uh, there is it's difficult to get access to the main actors so for example in my story uh, the story deals with uh, the story deals with the uh, a case of rhino uh, poaching which happened in may on may 9th uh, it was discovered in the eastern range of uh, kaziranga national park so from my initial uh, so when i started uh, i'm getting into the story i i found that the group was i mean they 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 were they were there were small reports about the the presence of the group in the local newspapers there was there was small mention of how some uh, armed uh, poachers are you know active in the area so that is that is where i took the lead from and then i then then i got in touch with the local journalists and subsequently with the with with the with the with the uh, enforcement agencies to figure out what had what what actually happened later later in june the group uh, 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 may in may end in fact there was there was the law enforcement agencies could uh, lay their hand on the group one of them was killed and uh, again in june there were people who were the, the the whole group was arrested so that is when the story started unraveling on who these people were it later turned out that they belonged they had uh, links with an insurgent outfit which is active in a in manipur which is a state bordering myanmar it's 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 it's, it's a state which also borders assam and it's uh, it's a known uh, so to say on a smuggling route how drugs uh, wildlife parts arms and other things they move uh, from india on or from india to uh, myanmar and china and uh, similarly the come uh, the drugs come from myanmar and so on so this is how i reported the story uh, the other things how, what the other things how i managed uh, you know what helped me in this story is uh, number one for mostly how i uh, you know the the, the the basic thing was pitching the story to the right publication so i got in touch with uh, i found that oxpeckers was interested uh, in uh, covering uh, such cases so i got in touch with the editor and she seemed quite keen so that was a lot of help then uh, you know once the story was approved the next big task was how to kind of report the story how to get into the story how to get the data how to get uh, so there were there were there were there, there were problems on uh, each uh, step you had uh, there was because because of lack of data one had to you know look for other sources so what i found was you could uh, you know a good source is uh, the you know the questions that the member of parliament ask in each session so in every parliamentary session you have the mps asking questions to the government so there there are a lot of questions which are asked about wildlife and uh, poaching and so on so the government gives uh, 
data facts figures and this this is this is one of the most accurate uh, data which is available in public domain secondly local sources of information local uh, there are a lot of websites uh, which are you know which are active now a lot of there are there, there are a lot of journalists um, in different districts who are covering small small incidents so they are in the know of uh, what what is going on in that particular area they may not be able to uh, you know draw the whole the full picture but they have they have crucial information and if you collaborate with them uh, properly it it really helps then there are in assam especially there are a lot of ngos uh, in the wildlife sector who are very very active and they maintain they 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 are they have been uh, the 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 activists working in these ngos have been very uh, you know they are they are experts in their fields so they have domain knowledge so that 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 really helps thirdly thirdly what what really helps is how you know you make use of uh, tools strike right, right to information if for example uh, officials are uh, very very uh, you know kind of kg when it comes to sharing information they don't trust journalists they don't know what you will write they are uh, you know so there, there is there is there is uh, there is sometimes uh, you know a kind of uh, discomfort on their part in parting with information and uh, keeping taking into account the lack of data in public domain there are there are uh, few avenues that you could go to if to get access so right to information is one such avenue which you it takes a lot of time it it is very very time consuming so i would advise you to start uh, early you know to plan uh, early and to you know plan long term and keep filing rtis of uh, you know the stuff that you are interested in so that you have you can have a kind of uh, flow of information you know once they people start replying to i mean if you are one application gets rejected then there, there is there, there is always an option to appeal and if one officer is not uh, comfortable then the, the the person hearing your appeal might you know might just decide to give you what you need so that is uh, another uh, app, you know kind of uh, tool which you could use uh, to Uh, kind of uh, get access to information important information thirdly you could uh, also look for uh, court cases and uh, the documents that the government and other agencies submit as affidavits so they have they have uh, in ongoing court cases uh, the government usually submits their side their side of the story in uh, the form of an affidavit so these affidavits also have uh, these affidavits also have a lot of information in it and uh, lastly i think it is very important to uh, you know go go to the ground and talk to the people to find out uh, what is you know what is going on in that particular area who are the who are the who are the actors for example i reported uh, i reported on a place called churachandpur on the myanmar border which is emerging as the hub of wildlife trafficking and also other kind of smuggling which happens so if while talking to the people there i realized that it's it's no secret i could not travel because of covid 19 restrictions but 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 the story is out there for people to do so this 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 was my brief experience i'll be happy to answer questions later thank you thank you very much sadik it's really interesting um i i thought we would, we could just address a couple of questions that are directly um addressed to you first before we move on to um our last speaker um there's a sure. question um here uh this person wants to know what's your take on the reasons for reduction in rhino poaching in assam particularly interested in understanding whether funding from national and international ngos um has been the main driver of this change or has it been an overall institutional push has the government funding to assam forest department changed uh, so can i answer this yes this is this is for you to answer now okay yeah so i think it's 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 a mix of a lot of things which has uh, resulted in this reduction 
so this year we have only seen uh, two cases assam would normally see uh, you know i mean there have been years when they saw as many as 37 cases also but 5 6 from you know now it has come down to two i think there is there is there, it has been a coordinated effort ngos of course have played a big role in it in sensitizing in taking uh, you know in taking these uh, uh, incidents uh, you know discussing these these incidents regularly you know taking up with the government and other agencies but there uh, but you know rhino is kind of very important uh, has a has a very important place in the sme society so that so after and uh, so apart from the ngos uh, uh, playing up their part there has been a lot of uh, kind of you know push from the society itself which has resulted in uh, uh, government action and the government the, the, the state government which is uh, which is led by the bhartiya janata party by the way they uh, they have uh, seen kind of that their 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 push on controlling poaching is helping them uh, you know maintain perception of a clean uh, is is aiding to their perception of running a clean government in the state so uh, so they have really really cracked down on uh, the poaching networks and they have uh, the local poaching networks they are now cracking down as my story kind of uh, points to that they are now kind of uh, getting to the bigger networks so far they were confined to how to you know control uh, poaching and how to secure the national park so they 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 have uh, they, there has been a number of arrests there has been uh, a, i mean a, a lot of people uh, this uh, this arrests have been become controversial also because uh, there have been instances where uh, locals have claimed that people who were not involved in these activities have uh, you know also been picked up by the in the forest department or the police similarly there have been a lot of uh, encounter killings as well some of them have you know again become uh, become controversial and they were they they were there was a suggestion that uh, they were not uh, the people who were uh, there was an allegation that the people who were killed were not uh, related who who, were, who had nothing to do with poaching but 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 all this has acted as a big deterrent and that that is what that is why you are seeing that the numbers have come down funding uh, to be honest i am not aware of uh, what are the figures uh, as of now so i won't be able to comment on that thank you yes it's just there's another question uh, a very interesting question how was your rapport with the forest department um is making them come out as heroes of a story make them comply more sorry so there's a question about your rapport with the forest department you were doing yes. a story um you know it, whether the story make make them look like heroes and that would help them to um comply i think that's a question okay so uh i think i have been uh, so this is this is uh, you know uh, so i have been covering kaziranga off and on in the last uh, two and a half years so i mean i have interacted with the local officials on a number of occasions so they are they are kind of familiar with me and uh, you know that they they also know that i am interested in these stories so there is some kind of familiar so some level of familiarity which uh, which which makes them comfortable in sharing uh, information but at the same time the forest officials are uh, really really uh, you know they are really really careful about uh, sharing uh, information about ongoing investigations and it takes it took me a lot of effort to get this uh, info out and this was not uh, and this was not a one source info this took me like you know this this took me uh, going to at least like 10 to 12 different officials to piece together piece it together thank you there's a question on whether you can uh, shed light on the uh, on the estimates of how many cases end up being unreported or undetected 
so it's difficult to say but there are there have been uh, the, the people working on the ground they have uh, found uh, instances of uh, cases uh, you know which they uncovered later so they say that they, there is there is a possi- also the terrain is difficult so one doesn't you know one can never be sure but there are certainly there are cases which are which go unreported i mean i don't have an estimate of how many but certainly there are uh, cases which are not reported for a variety of reasons. Another question is about um, the, whether you have seen a change in attitude when dealing with non-charismatic species. Sorry, I could not hear you. Whether you have seen a change in attitude when dealing with non-charismatic species. I mean, I my, uh, you know, to be very honest, my, uh, uh, experience of reporting is uh, on these cases. I mean, I have, I mean, I go to these, uh, my, I mean, I'm mostly a political journalist and, uh, you know, and uh, I, wildlife crime is uh, one of the things that I have uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, take off and on, but uh, not, I mean, it's not my beat, beat per se. So I would not be able to kind of comment uh, give an honest comment on this. One last question before we move to um, Marius, the next speaker. Um, we can still come back to some of your questions because I can see there, there are more questions here. Um, before we move on, we just look at one more question. Um, there's a question on whether you Sadiq, have looked into the case of elephants, conversion of wild to captive and smuggling, um, whether you've looked into elephant trafficking. I I tried, you know, I, I mean, I was hoping to do a story last year of how elephants are transported out of Assam to other states, especially uh, used for, you know, in for religious purposes. But that I have, you know, then COVID came and I have left it for another time. Maybe after the pandemic, I'll go back to it. Thank you. Thank you, Sadiq. Um, Thank we'll you. now move on to the last speaker. Marius Dyer, who will walk us through how to conduct a compelling investigation into wildlife trafficking. Over to you, Marius. Hi, I think hello. I need to stop sharing your screen first. Yeah, that's good. Marius, we can see you Hi, now. Great. Hello to everyone. Uh, so, my uh, name is uh, Marius uh, Dyer. I am a freelance. Uh, journalist from Romania. I am currently conducting uh, investigation from uh, for Newsweek Romania and uh, other international publication. Before starting, I uh, would like to thank you, Internews uh, Europe, for the opportunity to work on investigation to the highest uh, standards. I would also like to point out that the editorial support provided by uh, for Inter News has been very helpful and has uh, contributed substantially to rising professional standard in as far as I'm concerned. Um, until the wildlife, I investigate uh, corruption money laundering, energy, and many other uh, topics. My first contact with uh, wildlife was uh, two years ago when I obtained a micro grant to investigate the problem of uh, star jones in the Danube Delta and uh, black caviar trafficking. I have been working in the press for 13 years and I have faced many tough topics and uh, I have uh, idea of the magnitude of the corruption phenomenon at local and European level, but what uh, was hit during the documentary simply shocked me. I could not believe that behind only on 
endangered species, in my case, uh, sturgeons, there can be so many financial interest and corruption at the highest level. At uh, that moment, I asked uh, myself, where have I been so far? On what world have I lived in since I haven't seen what's happened in this file? I am not a follower of uh, advice and I don't believe in uh, receipts or uh, templates to help you conduct a successful investigation. You can waste a lot of time working uh, on the wrong uh, track, but uh, only in this way you can uh, reach the truth by eliminating all the information that does not come true. Regarding the investigation, poaching and trafficking in black uh, caviar to Star Jones, I also started for the public perception that uh, fishermen are the honest who poach and carry out the trafficking. Trafficking in black uh, caviar is a crime that brings a lot of money to those who practice uh, it. Black caviar is more valuable than gold. In the first stage of my documentation, I qualified everything that uh, means public uh, institution then uh, take care of this uh, species. And uh, what did I discover? Dozens of public institutions, including uh, ministries, uh, agencies, uh, university, research institutes, uh, all these uh, uh, public institutions, in many cases, uh, working uh, in the same uh, topics. Also, I find the political decision uh, and uh, legislative and uh, governmental level that uh, do not take into account the danger of sturgeons, but uh, certain financial uh, interest. Saying what uh, I went into and how confused uh, things uh, were, I decided to stop uh, this direction of uh, investigation and uh, went far, but directly to the source in the fishing communities, which uh, as it was public climate, would be those who poach and traffic black caviar. I have to tell you that uh, these uh, fishing uh, communities in uh, Romania are very close, especially with uh, journalists. Uh, they confessed uh, to me that they were at uh, the disposal of uh, journalists many times, and every time the journalists did not tell the truth, they found this toast, what they said, accusing the media of playing the games of uh, interest uh, groups. Finally, once I uh, arrived in the fishing uh, community, I had another shock. I honestly expect, uh, expected uh, people who trafficking in uh, caviar such an expensive uh, commodity to live in uh, condition, if not uh, opulent, at least uh, decent. What I found, I found a community living in extreme poverty and forgotten by the authorities. Then I asked me myself another question, or oh, where is the money for the caviar? traffic. What I discovered, sturgeons, uh, poachers and caviar traffickers are uh, criminals with uh, relationship 
and the highest level in the state. They pay the police, the border guards, the customer guards, and everything they can pay in order to be able to carry out their illegalization in peace. Sturgeons uh, pouching and caviar traffickers are people with a lot of money, equipped with uh, boats much more powerful than those of uh, border police and they are using them to poach technology much more advanced than those by Romanian state institution. Traditional fishermen are involving in poaching uh, only when by chance they catch sturgeons in uh, the neck and without the help of the network of uh, professional pouchers, if we can say uh, so, they cannot sell the caviar. There is the red communication uh, line, well developed, the caviar is taken and uh, cannot they sell the caviar. So, another way to trafficking uh, caviar for uh, wild sturgeons, it's uh, through aquaculture farm set up with uh, European foods. Caviar extracted from uh, uh, pouched with sturgeons, it's uh, sold to these uh, aquaculture farms that uh, not uh, actually produce caviar or uh, produce very little, and then it is uh, convenient to buy caviar for pokers and uh, at fairly low price to resell is as a caviar producer on pay our uh, farm. Concluding on the, this uh, subject, I can uh, say that the last uh, indigenous wild sturgeons in Europe, those in the Danube Delta, are still in danger due to the corruption. Next, uh, I, um, I will to, to, to speak uh, to you about uh, my second uh, project uh, uh, and uh, working with uh, data at uh, European uh, level. Uh, about uh, discrepancies and uh, East and uh, West uh, European. Just a minute, I'm, I'm sorry. So, uh, I started for the fact that the country of uh, the uh, Eastern Europe, a uh, country such as uh, Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia, Ukraine, there uh, were no significant uh, reports or not uh, at all, as uh, is the case of Romania, which in uh, 2018 and 2019, there was not uh, incidents of confiscation of uh, arrest. From the beginning, I must to tell you that uh, at last in Romania, uh, there is no such uh, centralized uh, databases that can show a picture close to the reality of the wildlife uh, trafficking uh, phenomenon. There are many institutions, police, uh, border police, uh, which have uh, information, but are not uh, centralized. Even in the case of trials and uh, conviction, uh, there are no statistics to show how things are. Uh, however, I found uh, one solution. 
Once the portal of the Romanian court, I enter the keyword pouching, and uh, it shows me all the files in uh, progress. Entering uh, the files, I have the opportunity to find out uh, the file number, the name of uh, the defenders, and the brief uh, description starting the conviction. But what is more important at this stage, we can uh, find out the number of the court decision. With uh, that number and uh, data, I can enter, enter in another website when I can find uh, anonymize all the information of the trial, including the investigation of the prosecutor office and the judge motivation. I can uh, practically have access to all information in uh, a file, but uh, must be taken one by one. This is uh, how I managed to obtain the data from Romania, but uh, in neighboring countries such as Bulgaria or Ukraine, it's very difficult to access uh, uh, due uh, to the Slavic uh, alphabet different for uh, the Latin one, which make um, uh, for me for difficult to access uh, the data. In order to have a picture somewhat uh, close to the reality of situation in uh, Europe, I use uh, anal reports of uh, CITES, which have an uh, incidence reporting system, but information collected is not only uh, partial public uh, in the report. The data provided by uh, CITES as uh, European level shows uh, discrepancy between reports uh, from Western European country and uh, Eastern European uh, country. In sense that uh, Western European country report more incidents. Several uh, specialists justify uh, this in the fact that the Western country there are the largest uh, and important ports and airports, transit point of cargo containers, and uh, have uh, a lot of connection with the country in Africa, Asia, and uh, especially in uh, China. A special uh, case that caught my attention in uh, area on the border between uh, Poland and uh, Ukraine, where the Polish authorities reported uh, hundreds of indigenous spent a uh, year of uh, confiscation, confiscation and uh, arrest, and uh, no incidents were reported on the border between Ukraine and uh, Romania. Specialists to try to justify this phenomenon by the fact that the policy in Poland is recognized as demanding and the one in Romania is uh, easily corruptible. The hot spot uh, in uh, Europe uh, for uh, wildlife uh, trafficking are uh, mostly in uh, Eastern Europe and is Istanbul uh, Airport, uh, which has have uh, many connections with uh, Asia. Western uh, European ports in uh, Italy, in Spain, in Belgium, and uh, Eastern European country and uh, Eastern uh, border. In conclusion, the data shows that uh, Europe is both the mine market and an important uh, transit uh, point for uh, wild uh, trafficking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marius. Thank you. Um, we are now going to 
to uh, address some of the questions here, um, you would see that we have already answered um, many of the questions. So uh, please check um, the answers we have already typed in. Um, we would like to go through some of these questions live here. So there's a question uh, for you, Marius. I thought we can start with that. Um, this question is about uh, NGOs, the role of NGOs as facilitators um, for development projects uh, to ensure that they have uh, proper uh, EIA assessment, uh, environmental impact assessment. Uh, what's your take on that? It's what I think they do in, uh, in India, the NGOs play an important role. Um, how is it in Europe? So, uh, I can speak to what I find uh, in Romania about the uh, NGO. Uh, I found uh, many NGOs uh, uh, have uh, many projects with uh, billions of uh, euro uh, money from the European Union, but uh, they have not uh, opened outputs for uh, this community, for this area in uh, Danube uh, Delta, um, they have uh, not impact. No impact, this you is, say. Uh, this is my opinion, uh, uh, are spent a lot of money without impact of the, these uh, speeches, uh, sturgeons of uh, uh, also, uh, they not have impact uh, in the community. Okay, thank you. Um, I think there's this question, which I think is uh, addressing to both uh, Marius and Sadiq. What, um, what are the perils you faced as an external investigator with no support or backup from the official setup? Do you face any dangers, any risks? you conduct your investigation? Hi. Hi, so, uh, Yeah, hi, hi. Do you want to put on your video? One second, I'll just... Uh... Hi. So, yes, if I were to... Uh, can you see me now? Yes. Yeah. So if I were to travel to, for example, Churachandpur, which, uh, which is the base for this, uh, you know, which is, the, which is now emerging as a transit hub for uh, uh, wildlife trafficking and other trafficking and smuggling, I would have, uh, you know, there was, there could have been uh, a danger because, because uh, this, that is the hub of uh, smugglers and also a lot of insurgent groups who are allegedly involved in these networks but because of covid uh, because of covid i could not travel there nevertheless i mean once when you are uh, working on these stories there's also there's always a danger but that's i mean that's that's a given if you are working uh, as a journalist in a i mean in a conflict zone so there there, there are there, there are always uh, you know there are always risks involved and you find ways to keep yourself uh, as safe as you can you know yeah, there's a and similar you, question also to Mario. Sorry, um, continue, Sadiq. Yeah, and you, I mean, I, one cannot uh, kind of uh, expect uh, to move around with uh, guards or, you know, expect the government to give you uh, any kind of uh, security or things like that, because that would defeat the purpose of uh, being a journalist. You want to add, Marius? This um, out from Nepal. Yeah. Out from Nepal is asking the same question. Can you repeat the question? Yes. Because uh, the question is, um, how dangerous it is for journalists to do wildlife trafficking investigation? Have you have you faced any risks in your investigation? <clears throat> Uh, so, um, you, you see in my presentation why, why I said that uh, 
the corruption is at a high level in uh, Romania. And uh, uh, this, uh, particularly in Romania, about Star Jones, about uh, caviar, uh, if you disturb uh, these uh, uh, networks, it's dangerous because you do not let uh, them to take a lot of money. But uh, uh, in my experience in uh, Romania as an investigative uh, journalist, uh, uh, we don't have a problem with uh, this because uh, our uh, many structure of state uh, to help us, uh, you understand? No. At one risk, exist but uh, if you go to take the investigation thinking at uh, risks you don't finish your, your work you need to assume your work uh, indifferent anyway any risk i think there's a related question as well um let me find this question again. Oh, yeah, the question is from Amoli Brewa, um, asking whether you faced any controversies that challenged the release of your work. I'm guessing that he's asking whether, you know, whether there are any sort of, um, whether you face any obstacles when you are releasing your, your report, your story. Do you get, you know, have you were you approached to ask not to not to publish a story, for example? No, in my case, uh, no, not happened. Uh, 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 as a freelancer journalist, uh, I pitch uh, the topics uh, before I work, uh, and uh, I have uh, no problem in this uh, case. What about Sadiq? Not so far, no. I haven't been asked to... Uh, I mean, uh, I have come under pressure for other things, uh, you know, reporting on other sensitive uh, things in the area. For example, uh, Assam is also the place uh, where uh, an uh, exercise called the National Register of Citizens took place, which became very controversial. So, so there was some kind of, you know, there, there, were, there were things happening around that, but nothing on the wildlife uh, crime front so far, thankfully. Thank you. Um, there's a question on impact from Idila Razak. What sort of impact have your investigations made on the trafficking networks in both Roman Romania and in Assam? Too early to say, it just came out yesterday. Experience from previous stories relating to uh, wildlife trafficking. Have you done other stories on wildlife trafficking before? So, uh, I mean, I have done other stories uh, on uh, environment. Like, for example, uh, giving you a small example of. Uh, so there was a recent incident in, uh, in what you call uh, Assam, uh, in the in the in a place called Tinsukia, which is in Upper Assam, uh, bordering. Uh, very close to the Myanmar border, in fact. So a natural gas, gas well witnessed a blowout in, uh, uh, in end of May, May 27th to be precise. And that, that, that well is right next to a national park, like right at the border. So uh, I was among the first journalists to point out that how uh, the, so every national, every protected area in India needs to have a uh, eco-sensitive zone which is basically kind of a buffer to protect it from all kinds of you know, polluting industries and uh, human activity, et cetera. So I was the first one to point out how, say for example, that in, in that case, how the eco-sensitive zone was cut short to help oil exploration and uh, drilling. So I, I mean, after I wrote uh, a story for a local uh, website, a local environmental website, everybody picked it up from there. And it became uh, it became uh, the most important talking point in that whole episode. 
of how uh, how the oil the public sector oil company has been uh, flouting uh, environmental rules so reporting does make an impact uh, you know and sometimes it's very it's you can see it how 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 uh, how people react to things after they read uh, laws being flouted and uh, you know and how they are being flouted okay thank you there's a, there's a question on um, what, what do you see are the benefit of uh, working um, working with open data portals for investigation do you find it useful have you been using it Yes, uh, I mean, uh, one, I mean, as a journalist, I always look for uh, databases, which both uh, government and uh, the ones like uh, WildEye, because that's where you you get uh, all your, uh, you know, th that's where you get the data from. And it helps in building up the story and, uh, you know, make it make it more convincing. When you put the numbers in the story, people, uh, you, you know, it, it, it gets a whole lot of weight. And there is and there is a lack of um, you know uh, such databases in India, and I'm happy that Wild uh, Wild Eye is kind of foraying foraying into India, and uh, I hope to see a good database in the near future. Thank you, Marius. Do you want to answer this question as well on so, using uh, open data? Uh, as a journalist, I use uh, many open data bases, but uh, in uh, this case, uh, I don't find uh, any uh, well uh, databases with information about the uh, wild uh, life. It's very, very difficult to, to make information uh, accurate about these uh, uh, topics. Uh, uh, I read on the CITES uh, reports uh, what they report uh, and uh, trafficking are only 15% what happened in the world. And then we, we don't have uh, uh, any databases with uh, information about uh, wild uh, trafficking. I, I want to ask uh, Sadiq in uh, India, when you find the uh, information uh, like this, you have? Uh... No, there is, there is no database. It's very difficult to find uh, information. That's what yeah, that... Because, uh, because for me in Romania to go to the uh, court uh, portal and uh, take uh, files one by one uh, was very difficult. Uh, I need uh, very much time and uh, after I finish uh, the work I don't have a, a real picture of the phenomenon. No, it's really difficult even here, you know, if, if, if the case has gone up to the high court, then it's easier, you know, because then you can access, if you know the details, then you could access online. It, it becomes very, very easy. But in lower courts, it's, it's very difficult to access. Okay, um, because of the time, um, we have many questions and we have a lot of participants today, so there are a lot of questions. So um, I want to apologize that we may not be able to answer all your questions, but we hope um, we could also try to answer them uh, later on by email. Um, so I'm going to move on to a few more questions um, before we have to wrap up the, the webinar today. Um, I think this question is quite interesting and is directed to Sadiq and I would like to um, get this question across to him. Um, how do you deal with the trade off of exposing, exposing the link between insurgency or extremism and illegal wildlife trade and that can uh, unknowingly lead to profiling or, margin, you know, or marginalization of, of certain groups or, or supporters of or sympathizers of these groups? So, for example, in my piece, I have, uh, you know, in my article, I have, uh, I have been very careful to not uh, point kind of any kind of allegations at the community as such. I have uh, focused on the group per se and how it 
it i mean how the investigators are finding links to its involvement and uh, you know what i have found uh, uh, from my conversations with the people there they, are, they, they it's it's known to the locals there that uh, that these kind of groups are active uh, on uh, the wildlife trafficking front and they themselves want action to be taken you know so i don't i don't see how it could lead to profiling of i mean my writing about a group could lead to profiling of a community for example i mean i i would i would like to know i mean i mean if the the person who has asked this question could uh, you know follow up with more uh, you know could give me more details of what uh, i mean i was just looking at it i could i could i could uh, I, i'll be happy to answer it on email in fact if there are yeah, if there is so a follow up to this so there is the, i think there are a few journalists who would like to or you know, a few uh, participants today would like to get in touch with our speakers um, after the webinar so um is one uh, asking um, to contact sadiq um a journalist in in india sadiq do you want to respond to that now i will just uh, put my email in the chat box would that be all right yeah i'm just doing that right away great all right um i think there are a few more questions relating to uh well i which i like to um post to roxanne um what is the best advice you can give to a first time user of well i um it's a great question uh sorry <laughs> okay um it's a fantastic question i think it sounds really simple but just play around um and see what does and doesn't work for you you know i would start by picking a topic um going onto the map and um filtering it trying out the filter function trying out the search search function um is the data and information that you're looking for uh, have we managed to provide it on wildeye if not um get in touch with us in the top left hand corner of the map or of the tool um you'll find a reach out and get the data tabs if you just scroll down um those those are also really useful uh for finding what you want specifically a couple of people asked and we we did answer um in the q and a um about accessing specific data or raw data so uh you can you can get in touch with us with us there but also um you know if you're really struggling then you're more than welcome to reach out to us at wildeyeasia@gmail.com um and we'd be happy to set up a call and take you through it and answer any questions that that you might have Thank you Roxanne there's another question about um collaborating with local journalists um mm. what is it for them and how do you work with local journalists Yeah we wanted to, we wanted to answer that because uh, a couple of people asked um what's in it for for them um it's a two way street so uh wild eye is a data sharing community so as much as we um want to give data we also want to get data back which is why we focused on journalistic investigations because it's a great way of collaborating um and of putting this information out there um we also offer obviously we can't guarantee everyone but we do also offer funding support and if we can't then we will try our best to direct you um the right way to to possible funding um but we also offer editorial support if we do work with you on a story um and if you also if you produce an investigation locally um and either are able to translate it into english or it's available in english then um we can also republish that on wildeye but i guess to answer your question uh potentially funding and that's that's kind of specific support Yeah, just to add to that um the earth journalism network also um you know put out calls for a uh, story proposals every now and then and, and in fact we have one um on at the moment um for journalists based in asia and the pacific um to submit uh, proposals of stories uh on uh, all kinds of environmental issues 
um, especially uh, we're especially interested in looking at sort of nexus of COVID-19 and um, environment. So uh, please check out our website um, for this opportunity. Um, Story Grants uh, opportunity um, will end um, on the 28th of August. Um, one last question before we end today's webinar. Um, there's a question on indigenous communities. How do you see the traffickers um, are using indigenous communities and how vulnerable are they in the cases of wildlife trafficking and abuse from authority? Um, all speakers are, are invited to address. I think our, our journalists. I think our journalists should answer that question first. <laughs> You're a journalist too. <laughs> no, here uh, in Ass in Assam and Northeast India, there is uh, certainly this concern about how traffickers are using the indigenous groups and how they are leveraging their space and their you know kind of you know and getting them uh, part of these networks which which is which is very very i mean in the case of rhino poaching it's quite uh, evident in the sense that uh, there is a lot of involvement of uh, at all uh, levels of the uh, people belonging to the local communities for example uh, in i mean the the, the local conduits uh, in, in a rhino poaching uh, uh, kind of uh, operation are mostly from villages uh, on the periphery of the national park. I mean, in the aftermath of a poaching, uh, it happens that a lot of innocent people also get uh, sometimes uh, get entangled into the investigations. But uh, but at the same time, uh, the one or two guys who are who are helping the poachers are from uh, are locals. And and even the even the rest of the chain, uh, the people, for example, who are coming in as expert shooters, uh, you know, who are who, who whose expertise is to shoot, and uh, they come with weapons and ammunition. So they are also mostly belonging to indigenous groups, you know, from the indigenous community. So there is certainly and uh, and there is certainly a need to kind of uh, do more work on this. I mean, being a journalist, I'm not the best person to advise on how to go about it but like for example on the on the on the on the conservation front there there have been some success stories here like for example the uh, in nagaland and manipur both the amur falcon conservation program that uh, the sensitization of the local communities have helped a lot and uh, now we see that the cases of uh, you know, hunting of the falcon have uh, almost uh, come down to negligible numbers from the from what they used to be earlier. Yeah, just just to add, I think that that's unfortunate. Well, fortunately and unfortunately, a global uh, problem. Um, I think indigenous communities are often, especially in third world countries vulnerable communities and are taken advantage of. Um, I mean, def we could definitely say the same for South Africa um, and where, you know, around the Kruger National Park where a lot of rhino poaching takes place. Um, but I just wanted to say that I think Sadiq's right in that there are a lot of important stories to tell there. Um, and these are, these are definitely the types of stories that we'd like to get out there. And that I think we need to see more of. That's that's something that uh, personally I don't see I don't see enough of in the media. So I think anyone who does have those kinds of stories or interest in those kinds of stories, um, I encourage you to to pursue them. Roxanne, Marius, you want to add anything? not we will um, end today's um, webinar thank you so much to all our speakers today um, and thank you to all the participants for the many um, very good questions we will be posting a recording of this webinar on our website of journalism.net in the next few days um, we'll be holding more webinars coming up and we'll post them on our website so do keep a look out 
And if you have topics to suggest for our future webinars, or if you produce stories drawing from uh, the content of our webinars, uh, we hope that you can share it with us um, by dropping us an email at info.ejn at internet.org. That's all for today. Thank you very much again for joining us. We hope to see you again at our next webinar. Thank you.